This is the Altair Duino. It's a hardware and software recreation of the Altair 8800. In a previous video, I've shown how we can load Altair Basic from this cassette tape into the machine so we can type our own programs and run our own code. In this video, I'm going to explore the Altair Disk add on. Just like the original Altair, the Altair Duino supports hardware expansion. So I've gone ahead and built and installed a floppy disk drive controller card. The controller card supports five and a quarter or three and a half inch drives, and in both cases, these emulate the original eight inch disks that were available for the original Altair. On the right hand side, you can see the Altair Duino Altair Disk floppy drive enclosure. This particular kit was available from Adwater and Stir for a brief period of time. However, Chris Davis, the owner of Adwater and Stir, has made the laser cutting files available if you'd like to cut your own acrylic case for a floppy disk drive. While I did indeed purchase my floppy drive enclosure from Adwater and Stir, as you can see, the shade of grey used in the two plastics doesn't match precisely. So having access to those files might be very useful if, like me, you might consider trying to colour match them a little better in future. As you can see, I've gone ahead and opted for a three and a half inch drive and I have that installed in a five and a quarter inch sled so that it fits in the case properly. The controller card is recommended to be used for TIAC drives. However, I'm using a Mitsumi drive, which I have modified very slightly. The original drive had a green LED, but as we'll see in operation, I've replaced that with a red LED for aesthetic purposes. Back in the 1970s, when the original Altair disk became available, its main use was with Microsoft's Altair Disk Basic. This would allow you to save and load programs from floppy disk, which was much faster than the contemporary paper tape punches that people were using at the time. While MITS did eventually release a more fully featured disk operating system, or DOS, in the intervening period, CPM became the preeminent operating system for the Altair and related S100 bus computers. CPM was originally conceived, programmed, and designed by a Dr. Gary Kildall. It was used to allow him to connect his floppy disk unit to his Intel Intellec microcomputer. CPM offered a consistent way for user programs to interface with the display, keyboard, and floppy disk unit. While there's lots to say about Dr. Kildall and his role in early computer history, I think one of the most important was actually his public-facing role as the co-host of The Computer Chronicles with the show's creator, Stuart Schiffey. Many of the episodes of The Computer Chronicles are available free of charge on the Internet Archive. So if you're at all interested in the early history of computing, then I'd encourage you to head over to the link in the description and check out some of the videos there. I've actually got a copy of Gary's operating system CPM on this very 2000s translucent pink floppy disk right here. But the Altair is a very basic computer. As we know from my previous video, when you turn it on, it doesn't really have any concept of any external storage or even the keyboard and display. So if I stick the disk in the drive, how do we get the data off the disk and into the computer's memory? As this is an Altair Duino rather than an original Altair, I can use the built-in software to load the disk. In this case, all I need to do is flip this switch up here and depress the OX1 switch. As you can see, we're now running CPM 2.2b version 2.3 for Altair 8-inch floppies. As I mentioned, the disk drive on the right emulates an 8-inch floppy that would have been used with the original Altair. But what about if you didn't have an Altair Duino? How would people do that back in the 1970s? Well, it'd be very common for you to get a PROM card or PROM card that would install in the machine and would contain a PROM or ROM that would allow you to load from the disk. You would go ahead and set the memory address on the front panel switches. You would inspect that memory location using the examine switch and you would choose to run from that location. That would run the program in ROM that would allow it to access the disk drive and bootstrap the program. But maybe you didn't have one of those. How would you go about doing it then? If we think back to how you load BASIC from a cassette tape, there's an appendix B in the user manual that tells us how to load and initialize BASIC. The way this works is it gives us a short program that we toggle in using the front panel switches. This gives the computer just enough smarts to talk to the cassette interface card and load the first stage bootloader from the cassette tape. This then loads a second stage bootloader that loads BASIC itself into the computer. The bootloader that may have been installed on a PROM card inside the computer is of course just 8080 instruction code, 
and so it would be possible to toggle it in on the front of the computer. However, such bootloaders for floppy disk drives tend to be quite long and complicated, and so it's not something you'd want to toggle in the machine every time you turned it on for the first time in the morning. However, if you've been slowly upgrading your computer, it's probable that you had some other ways of loading code into the machine. For example, a punched paper tape machine, or like me, a cassette interface. One way we can avoid having to repeatedly toggle in a long bootstrap loader every morning into our machine is to store that bootstrap loader on a cassette tape like this. So let's go ahead and connect our existing cassette interface card to the cassette recorder. Of course, just like with Altair Basic, we now need to toggle in a simple bootloader so the computer knows how to talk to the audio cassette interface card. Fortunately, we can use the exact same program here that we used to load Basic to load the bootloader from the cassette tape. You'll notice that there's some instructions here for the different types of Basic, and for something on a disk, we need to put 77 in this space here, and so that's the only modification we will need to make. If you'd like to see more information about this program and how it works, do check out my video on loading Altair Basic from cassette, and I'll have a link in the video description. To toggle the data in, I'm going to raise stop and reset at the same time to hard reset the machine and bring us back to address zero, after which I will toggle in each of the required bytes. Now I need to reset the machine to bring us back to address zero. But before we can execute our bootloader, we need to make sure our sense switches are set correctly. Just like with BASIC, we now need to set the sense switches so that the computer knows where data is coming from and going to. And just like before, we have a two SIO card with one stop bit, which requires a sense switch setting of one, and that requires us to raise a 12. And we're loading from an ACR card, which requires a sense switch setting of three, which requires us to set a nine and a eight. We can now press run and press play on the cassette recorder. In a few moments, we will hopefully see a eight here flash a little bit. And there we go. Then it will switch to a second stage where a six is flashing a little bit here. And then the disk drive begins to load. At this point, we can stop the cassette, and as you can see, CPM has loaded just as before. And so this is the exact same version of CPM loaded from the floppy disk, and we no longer need the cassette at all. This approach meant we only had to enter just 20 bytes into the machine using the toggle switches, the rest of the bootloader was loaded from the cassette that we already had, and finally, we loaded CPM from the floppy disk. So now CPM is up and running, why don't we explore it a little together? One of the first things we might want to do is list the files that are available on the disk. And there are two commands we can use for that. There's dir. And this shows all the files on the disk. And then there's an optional program called ls just here. And we can run ls and that gives us a little bit more information about the files on the disk, including the file size and how much capacity we have on the disk. We also have a program called stat, which can tell us a little bit about the disk. And as you can see, the disk is read-write and it has 10k of space, the same information we saw here from the ls command. There's also another command called survey, which tells us a little bit more about our machine. Again, it's told us a little bit more about the disk, but it's also given us a memory map of the computer, telling us what's available for us to use for programs, where CPM is located, and where the BIOS or unassigned data is currently configured. In this case, as it shows, all of the memory map is actually available as RAM. In our case, we don't have any ROMs in the machine whatsoever. That's because we toggled in our first stage bootloader, which loaded a second stage bootloader from the cassette tape, which then loaded the operating system itself, which knows how to interface with the disk drive. If I type ls again to see the files on the disk, we can see we have a variety of programs available. 
One of the interesting ones, of course, is mBasic, which is Microsoft Basic. And we can go ahead and run that now. This is the CPM version of BASIC. We can go ahead and load programs from the disk in CPM using the load command here. And we can type load. And we have a couple of programs on this disk that I'd like to look at. One of them is Eliza, which is a popular chatbot. We can list the program and we can see all of the code that makes up Eliza. So Eliza just breaks down the structure of the grammar of the words we are typing in, the sentences we are giving it, and it tries to formulate a reasonable response. So let's have a little go at Eliza. As you can see, this is a version from Creative Computing. So it says, hi, I'm Eliza, what's your problem? I'm gonna just say, hello, Eliza. And the computer thinks for a little while, as you can see by the flashing lights on the front. And it says, how do you do? Please state your problem. And I'm going to say, I think I am a dog. Did you come to me because you were a dog? Yes. Can you help? Don't you believe that I can help? You are only a computer. What makes you think I'm only a computer? I can, oh, let's type that correctly. I can see your flashing lights. Why are you concerned about my flashing lights? So as you can see, this is a fairly interactive little program and kind of fun and pretty impressive for the 1970s. Of course, the large language models of today, such as ChatGPT, Gemini, and so forth, give us much more capabilities, but this is an interesting little program. So let's quit out of this. We can exit out the program by pressing Control C, and this will bring us back to the basic prompt. I can actually type new here to clear the memory. If I type list now, we'll see that there are no program in the basic memory. And I can go ahead and load another program, and that is Life. And so this is Conway's Game of Life. Again, I can list this program to have a little look at it. It's not particularly long. And I can go ahead and run it. And again, you can see this is another example from Creative Computing. In this case, it's asking us for our starting pattern for the computer program. And the way this works for this particular program is you start each line with a dot, and then you use stars to represent the filled cells and spaces for unfilled cells. And I'm going to go ahead and enter a common Methuselah pattern, uh, like so. And when you're done, you type done, and then it will start the simulation. So first up, it goes ahead and it outputs the original pattern you provided. And then it will go through and calculate what the next generation will be. As you can see, this is generation zero, and there's a population of seven live cells. Here we go, it's now calculated the first generation and updated it, and we still have seven live cells. And this is the second generation with nine. The third generation with nine. the fourth generation with 10, and the fifth generation with 12. And this pattern will go on for quite some time, but as you can see, running it in basic is actually quite slow. Now, I actually do sometimes bring in these retro machines to show to my students to show that it was absolutely possible to do them on much more basic hardware back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I'm gonna quit out of this program again by pressing Control C. 
and then I can go back to the operating system CPM by typing system. Now, if I type ls again, we can see the other files that are on this disk. And you'll see, if we look down in alphabetical order, we have life.baz, which is the basic program, but we also have life.com. Now, this was authored by someone else. It wasn't a creation of my own. And it does actually require the Zalo Z80 CPU. So I've had to configure my Alt Arduino to run in Z80 mode. This means the Life program wouldn't run on an Alt 8800 unless it had, had its CPU upgraded to a Zilog Z80. Nonetheless, let's give it a go. As you can see, we have a randomly generated field. And as you can see, this updates much faster with a much larger number of cells in the initial state. And there's no problem with it keeping up here. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any way of configuring the play field here or giving a count of how many cells or the number of generations. There is a restart button and we can reset the play field to a new random pattern. And I can do that as much as I like. And of course I can press Q to quit back to the CPM operating system. And again, we can list the files available on the disk. As you can see, there are a few other files available here on the disk, some important ones, such as how we can format disks, how we can create new versions of the system disk using sysgen. There's also an assembler and a basic editor. However, I think I've shown you all I wanted to show about how we can use CPM with a modern floppy disk here and bootload it actually using a cassette tape as a second stage bootloader to avoid having to have a PROM card installed in an Altair, be that an original or this Altair Duino. So I hope you found this video about CPM and the Altair 8800 interesting, and I hope to speak to you again soon in the next video.